really a great pleasure to be back uh, in Lisbon at the Lisbon Consortium. I want to thank you and Mr. Jill and all the others who are responsible for organizing uh, both the summer school and what it is, to my knowledge, one of a very, very unique uh, uh, group um, in the way it combines a serious interest in cultural studies with an equally serious interest in critical theory, uh, bringing together what often, uh, for some reason, are polemically opposed perspectives on the analysis of language, history, society, politics, art, and so on, trying to find ways to uh, uh, work together and not simply to oppose uh, and establish priorities. So I'm very, very uh, happy to be here. And you're absolutely right in talking and mentioning that translation is almost, uh, has become at least, and probably always was, my main medium. It's not even language, but it's, it's translation because I've always been in a position of working between languages whether as a writer, as a critic, as a, uh, a teacher. And um, uh, I find it a never-ending, uh, inexhaustible source of, of, of discovery um, to find out how languages are um, precisely incommensurable and, and different from one another. You know, when you start out translating, you're inevitably looking for similarities and, and identities. And it's extremely frustrating to find out that um, uh, languages are different. And even more so when you then discover that they're different not only from each other, but from themselves, in that words, such as the word translation, can mean very different things in the same language. And then what you can start to think about what these differences might signify, and that become, opens up a world of discovery. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about that uh, uh, today. Um, <clears throat> uh, you've, you, have, you all have a handout there. I, I've never, although I'm very, very into computers, for some reason I've never really developed an affinity for PowerPoint and its other, although I love being in the audience for the PowerPoint, but I don't like using it. Uh, uh, the reason, at least one of the reasons is I say that whatever else, if you have a handout, at least you won't go away empty-handed. <laughs> You'll have your hand out, and it gives you a chance maybe to think about these things as well as just seeing them flashed on, you know, on the uh, on uh, on the screen. So I want to thank again the organizers for making that possible. When, when we get to the longer quotes, I'll indicate those that if you, if you want, you can follow in your handout. So, so this talk, the title of my talk, the the political economy of global translation uh, could easily be misunderstood. And let me therefore begin by saying what I will not be speaking about. I will not be discussing the various financial impacts that globalization has had on the activities of translation. Not that these would not be worth discussing, but this is not what I have in mind or what I'm best best place to speak about with you today. Surely the growth of computer translations is only the tip of the iceberg here. As an exemplary manifestation of the progress of artificial intelligence, it reveals both the prowess and limitations of computational thinking and technology, both of which, of course, are rapidly evolving. To be able to get a sense of a Chinese web page, for instance, through a Google translation, is surely a welcome option for those of us who don't read Chinese. And the same could be said for the myriad of other languages from which we are shut out. Globalization makes interlingual communication a necessity and ostensibly easier. <coughs> but for that ease, it often exacts a price. And it is this price that I have in mind when choosing to speak about the political economy of translation. I'm going back here to a term, a phrase, that has long been out of fashion, namely the phrase political economy, mainly because I want to use it to problematize what I take to be one of the most serious trends resulting from the <coughs> academic division of labor today, namely the separation of politics from economics. The notion of political economy, although it had its origins in 18th century moral philosophy, 
culminated a century later, as you know, with the critical socioeconomic analysis of capitalism of Marx and Engels. The critical thrust of their analyses followed from their insights into the interdependence of economics and politics. And it is precisely this perspective that has largely disappeared from mainstream discourse today. In place of the political analysis of conflicting forces and interests at work, there has developed a tendency to look for monocausal factors that are then portrayed as either natural or inevitable or both. Instead, I want to use the notion of political economy involving the interplay of <coughs> conflicting forces and interests in order to ask how their interaction plays itself out in regard to practices of translation. I use the plural here, practices, because there are, of course, very different ways to practice translation corresponding to very different needs and uses. But they do have some things in common, whether for commercial purposes or scientific ones, whether poetry, philosophy, or fiction, what all forms of translation seem to share is a common concern for meaning. Translation, at least as commonly understood and as often practiced, seeks then to transport a meaning from one language to another. The idea of transport is often but not always based on the premise that a meaning can essentially survive its change of place. Here, the change in language. That it can survive it intact, if not entirely unchanged. No one would deny that the move from one language to another necessarily involves change. But the presupposition that informs many translations is that such changes can be considered marginal with respect to the centrality and universality of the meaning involved. Indeed, without being able here to delve very far into the question of the meaning of meaning, to quote the title of a once famous book by two British semanticists, C.K. Ogden and I.A. Richards, let me suggest just that the concern with preserving or maintaining something like the continuity of meaning uh, is a corollary of the widespread view, which is not necessarily one, by the way, that Ogden and Richards shared, of the widespread view that meanings are time and space transcendent, that they are either universal, or if not universal, then still sufficiently general to make it through the passage from one language to another relatively unscathed. The context-based theory of meaning developed by Ogden and Richards questioned this notion. They developed the notion of context-dependent meaning. But already a few decades before they published their book, namely in 1923, the Swiss linguist, Fernand de Saussure, was developing a very different theory of language and of meaning, or rather of the relation of language to meaning. Whereas Ogden and Richards argued that meanings were context dependent, and that the latter context involved the distinct experiences of individuals, Saussure argued for a language-based theory of signification that could be regarded as prior <coughs> to the existence of individual articulation as well as of meaning. In place of the conventional approach that was embodied in the semantic triad of Ogden and Richards involving symbol, meaning, and reference, Saussure ins uh, insisted that signs and symbols could only produce meanings by first of all being distinguishable from other signs. This may seem to be simple common sense, but Saussure presented it as an alternative to more traditional representational theories of signs. For Saussure, a sign, and hence language, could only point to a thing or a concept or represent it insofar as it could be differentiated from other signs. As he put it, difference was what constituted linguistic value a relational term that he introduced in order to substitute it 
for meaning. When Richards read the posthumously published notes of Saussure, his reaction was that Saussure's theory introduced illegitimately in his eyes interpretation into the semiotic process since it implied that there was no purely internal or conventional link between signans and signatum, between what Saussure called in French le signifiant, badly translated, by the way, as signifier, I'll come back to that, and signifié, better translated as signify. However, in making linguistic difference the constitutive element of signifying, Saussure introduced something like translation into the most basic operation of language. His argument was and is relatively simple. In order for Marx to relate to other things, things other than themselves, either to meanings or reference, those marks must be distinct from the other marks with which they interact and on which they in reality depend. No mark, according to this perspective, signifies independently of other marks. From this point of view, the famous octan richard semantic triangle of sign, meaning, and referent could thus be criticized as a misleading abstraction from what in reality was a far more complex relation of signifier and signified. Although the latter might look at first like a purely dyadic structure, the differential character of the signifier, the fact that it can only signify and point towards something or something else to the extent that it points away from other signifiers is uh, made crucial. The decisive relationship, as both Lacan and Derrida subsequently recognized, is therefore not that between signifier and signified, much less that between signifier and meaning or reference, but rather that between signifier and signifier. And this relationship is irreducibly differential. Let me give an example, as one says, a real life example from my own experience. Some decades ago on the highways, more decades ago than I want to remember, on the highways <laughs> in the United States, trucks stopped using the sign inflammable to indicate that the contents they were transporting were combustible and could, under certain circumstances, break out into flame, in flame. Instead, they began to resort to a little used word, flammable, to indicate the potential danger of what they were transporting. They did this to avoid the ambiguity associated with the word inflammable. In English, many, if not most words using the prefix in involve such ambiguities because in often means non as well as toward or, or to, so that an uncertainty could arise about whether the trucks that were designating themselves as transporting flammable materials uh, were actually had dangerous uh, uh, substances or not in them. The example that Saussure doesn't give this, this is not his example, but he didn't know anything about the trucks. <laughs> the example that Saussure uh, gives is slightly different, but equally illuminating. In handwriting, one is free to vary the forms of letters, as long as the letter is not confused with other letters, same thing with numbers. This, I suppose, is one of the reasons why uh, Europeans, and I think most people outside of North America, tend to write the number one with a pronounced hook at the top, and are then obliged to write the number seven with a bar across its middle, since otherwise the hooked one could easily be mistaken for a seven without the bar, as it's written in the US. The US one is one, and seven is seven. Another, uh, I can't tell you what I have suffered because of this, both 
as sending letters, receiving them, that never arrive because the post office doesn't know how to deal with the hooked one and the barred seven, and uses the one with the other. Uh, another of Saussure's examples is the difference between the French word mouton and the British sheep. Both may seem to have the same animal as their referent, but the fact that the British also have a different word, mutton, to distinguish that animal when it becomes an object of consumption, whereas the French or the French language does not, changes the signification or the value of these words without changing exactly their, their, their referent. What might this have to do now with translation? Well, if demarcation from other signifiers is required in order for a signifier to signify, in order for a linguistic or other mark to mean anything, then such differential relations shape the meaning of the signifier without necessarily being present in the consciousness of the speaker or writer. In short, the signifying function of a mark is in this sense already a translation, albeit a negative differential one, uh, not necessarily a conscious or deliberate one, involving differences differences from other marks. A written one must not be confused with a seven or an L. The capital letter O must not be confused with the number zero, etc. But the example, the first example I gave previously, using the prefix in, involves a translation of a different kind. Its ambiguity is precisely what the Saussurian notion of signifying of signifier was trying to control, if not avoid. In the case of the in, however, this is only possible by referring to a specific context, to a limited chain of signifiers that sur surround its usage. And here, so sure, in, in a strange way, uh, converges with the context theory of Ogden and Richards, uh, whom he didn't know. As Saussure puts it, in, of course, the edited version of his course, and you may or may not know that the edited version of Saussure's course uh, tried to systematize what Saussure himself uh, was working on and never felt that he wanted to publish uh, because it, uh, he was a much more speculative and bold thinker and didn't want to reduce uh, his, his thinking to anything that, would, that could be used as a textbook so that the course of general linguistics that had such a great influence on structuralism is in fact put together by uh, students of Saussure. In the meanwhile, we now have all the series of, of, of notes of his that reveal an exceedingly uh, interesting and much more uh, profound thinking about language than even you get in the, uh, in the published course. Um, so as Saussure put it now in the edited version of his course, on general linguistics, the differential value of a signifier uh, is determined by its differences from all the other signifiers, quote, that surround it. But how is that surrounding, what Ogden and Richards call context, to be determined? More precisely, how is it to be delimited? The very word delimit in English as in French as in other Romance languages, perhaps also in Portuguese, carries with it the same ambiguity as does inflammable. The D usually has a negative significance, but here it has a positive one as well, the D limit. Right? It's not to unlimit in ordinary language. Uh, the, the completion of, of limitation. But that completion is, as it were, haunted by the possibility of its non-completion. The undoing of limitation haunted by its delimitation. Delimitation as a word then, almost exemplarily, delimits itself. This, however, may turn out to be precisely what is going on more generally in language. For how are the limits of the chains of signifiers to which a single signifier relates first negatively in order to be distinguishable and then positively in order to signify, how are those limits to be set or fixed if, as in the case, as is the case with language, the chains and combinations are in principle virtually unlimited? 
So Searle recognized this problem negatively in his lectures when he resorted to, as, to the famous example of the chess game in order to exemplify what he sought to portray as the synchronic state of language. Uh, state of language is existing according to an outside of the temporal change. The fact that uh, the fact that its structure had to be consider uh, considered as a self-contained instant rather than as a temporal evolving diachronic process. So Sue knew well, by the way, that this was a fiction. But he said it's a fiction that we need to establish in order to uh, speak about language at, at, at all. What he forgot, however, in, in invoking this very interesting example of the chess game, and which he also recognized in his notes, but which you don't have in the published version, what he, what he, he overlooked was that the significance simply of the move, that we're dealing with a chess game. Every synchronic state in chess is intrinsically divided by the dissymmetry of the game itself. One player has a move, the other does not. That's why when you learn chess, you don't just learn the limited movements of pieces on the board, but you learn games, strategies, and so on. And this is why the rules of chess are not simply synchronic, governing the way the pieces can move on the board, but diachronic, including entire game sequences and strategies. Nietzsche, the word strategy clicks in. Nietzsche, some 20 years before Saussure, in the notes to a work he never published, which he planned to call the Book of the Philosopher, written in the 1870s, Nietzsche summed up this problem perfectly when he wrote, quote, infinity is the primordial fact. What must be explained is where the finite comes from. In short, Nietzsche is inquiring about the conditions under which the possibility of unlimited combination produces, and one has to say inevitably, the actuality of something limited. His response to this is of interest for our problem of global translation. He emphasizes in these notes and elsewhere that what Ogden and Richards call context and what Saussure calls the language system la langue is a result of multiple factors, including conventions, traditions, and situations, but that all of these will always be only partial, and not just partial, but partisan. The term that he will later introduce is that of perspective. Only a limited and particular point of view or position will allow what otherwise could be an unlimited play of signification to appear as a pre-given object or referent. But the forces that delimit such a perspective are by no means internal to it, and thus they remain in direct or virtual relation to the possibilities they also exclude. For the question of translation, this has two consequences. First, that any single word, sentence, or proposition is itself never entirely self-contained. Its signification depends on the perspectives it involves. Since, since such perspectives or positions are always multiple, never isolated, the unity of any word, sentence, proposition of its meaning can never be regarded as absolute. Overdetermination, the word that Freud uses, context, Benjamin also, is an indelible characteristic of signification in discursive language no less than in non-discursive media. Second, since the process by which the potentially infinite play of signification is limited by conventions, traditions, experiences that themselves are never universal because they are part of the process of signifying, which they also delimit, the result is that determinate languages, however they are defined, will never be entirely commensurable with one another. Linguistic difference is both an internal and external fact of what we call language. And this is reflected 
in another rather remarkable fact, namely that as far as I know, in English at least, no precise term exists to name an individual or individuated language. For instance, I am, I could say that I am speaking English, but there are many different Englishes, and I'm speaking at least or at most one of them, some sort of North American, but not British, Australian, Indian, or many other uh, Englishes. To be sure, in ordinary English, if there is such a thing, concesso non dato, linguists distinguish between dialects. But this, in turn, presupposes a language that is meta-dialectical. And strangely and significantly, there is no precise term, to my knowledge, that designates just how this meta-dialectical and yet individuated language, language should best be called. The two main candidates in, in English are national and natural. And each is more inaccurate than the other. There's nothing natural about an individuated language, even if it is never simply the deliberate product of an institution like the Académie Française. National seems a bit more plausible until, of course, one recalls that behind the so-called national identity of languages, they are not just, there are not just dialects, but substantially different languages. Here in Lisbon, I don't have to tell you that about Portuguese. German, of course, is spoken not just in Germany, but Austria, Switzerland, Belgium, the Netherlands, many other places. Same is true of French and English, but also of Chinese, which, of course, divides into two main uh, languages and then many, many others, and presumably of many other languages. And so the names used to designate and distinguish individual languages from each other and from their so-called dialects gives us a false sense of unity to what in practice is far less unified and self-identical. In short, the so-called source language that serves as point of departure and of reference in thinking about translation is already more complex and far less self-identical, above all less immutable than traditional notions of translation might like to believe. The same, of course, is true of the target language. The mutability and diversity of individual languages, then, constitute something like a force field in which the carryover, the translation, intervenes. I say intervenes here because translations always have to negotiate the relation of forces existing within and between languages at a distinct moment in space and time that is never simply universal, universalizable and which constitutes the irreducibly singular dimension of all translation, even if it is a dimension that in many situations can be minimized and marginalized. Let me give you an example of what I persistently encounter in working with and between German and English. German, English, and French, to be exact. In the passage I quoted before, Nietzsche is generally translated as writing about infinity, the infinite, and the finite. But the word infinity, he said, he writes, is the primordial fact. What must be explained is where the finite comes from. But the German word that he sets in italics here, actually in what in German at the time was called, it is called Spätdruck, which is somewhat different from italics because it involves increasing the spaces between letters of individual words to create a sense of emphasis, but also a certain sense of vacuity, of voice, of spreading something out, diluting it almost. Anyway, um, uh, uh, the words that he's using and that he puts in Spätdruck, we would say italics, Namely, Unendlichkeit and Das Endliche have very different connotations, it seems to me, in German than do their so-called equivalents in English. 
In English, when non-mathematicians at least use the word infinity, they associate with it the property of inordinate size, largeness. A dictionary definition, for instance, reads infinity, very large number or quantity, as opposed to very small, for example, to the infinitesimal. But in German, the word is composed of a negation that has, I would like to argue at least, a different connotation, unendlichkeit, which literally could be rendered as unendedness. Similarly, the word to which Nietzsche contrasted, das endige, which significantly again has the form of a substantivized adjective or adverb, is constituted around the root word end, that which is ended, which has an end, which is limited in time and space. The English words that are used to translate these two, namely infinitive, and the finite are based on a Latin verb, finire, which, despite its proximity to finish, hardly has the same resonances in non-technical, so-called ordinary English, as does the German word end, or for that matter, the English word end. In English, the result tends to hypostasize the word by obscuring its historical relation to verbs designating processes or actions, i.e. movements through space and time. Suppose the Unendlichkeit were translated as the unfinished, and opposed to the finish at for das Endliche. Instead of simply negating the limitations of time and space, this might suggest a movement that either comes to an end and stops or ceases to exist endlich, and another movement that has no end, whereas the lack of an ending would not be immediately and instinctively equated with an objective state of affairs. In other words, the Nietzschean insistence on the constitutive function of an always singular or particular perspective or point of view would, I believe, be better retained in the notion of unending or ended in a way that infinite and finite do not accomplish in English. On the contrary, the ostensible stability that the word infinitude seems to designate, although logically perhaps in contradiction or tension with the notion of boundlessness, still does not necessarily implicate a singular perspective or situation of the user of language in the same way that unending and ended do. In avoiding such an implication, the process of translation appears to have produced a stability and even a universality that excludes the always relational singularity of language situations and perhaps of languages too cool. The fact that languages are shared and serve as a medium of communication does not, in my view, alter this irreducible singularity. It merely disguises it behind the naturalization of conventions and traditions, which then are simply taken as given and self-evident and ultimately as natural. These reflections on language and languages allow me now to explain why I have certain reservations about the notion of global translation. Not because of translation, but, but rather because of the notion of the global. Here again, it may be helpful to proceed from a concrete instance. You doubtless know that in the Romance languages, there is an alternative designation for what in English is known as globalization and the global. This alternative does not mean necessarily the same thing, and that's precisely the point. I'm thinking of a term that it is impossible to translate into anything like idiomatic English, although God knows people have tried, uh, including myself. So I'll start with French namely mondialisation. Of course, the political and economic power of English in the process of globalization is, uh, has imposed even, that even the French now tend to use the word globalisation, although it still sounds rather barbaric. For a long tradition, fortunately, resists it. It's a tradition that invests the word monde with a significance that the term globe is rapidly absorbing, effacing, 
and transforming. Uh, in journalism, Le Monde, Divet are the names of leading daily newspapers. Globus, by contrast, is the name of a Swiss upscale department store chain. <laughs> as well, if you Google it as of a, a, a travel agency organizing escorted tours around and all over the world. In no language that I know of, and as indicated, I really know only three fairly well, are these two words, world and globe, simply interchangeable? Why not? Let me sh quote a short passage from one of my favorite novels, written long before what is known as globalization had arrived on the scene, but at a historical moment when the processes that would lead to it were already well underway. And by the way, there's a very interesting critique of globalization that says it's not at all dependent on, uh, only on technology, but in fact it's dependent on capitalist, uh, uh, the political, economic relations, capitalist states, and so on. So it, it may really be the beginning of globalization uh, there. The novel I'm, I'm speaking about is Stern's Tristram Shandy. Early in this novel, as the narrator Tristram is ostensibly trying to reconstitute the chain of events leading to his birth. He wants to start at the beginning, at Ovo, although he knows very well that Horace doesn't recommend it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, he introduces the, wo the woman uh, who will help bring him into the world. And he cuts, this is the first quote on your hand up. In the same village where my father and my mother dwelt, dwelt also a thin, upright, motherly, notable, good old body of a midwife, who, with the help of a little plain good sense and some years full employment in her business, had acquired in her way no small degree of reputation in the world. By which word need I in this place inform your worship that I would be understood to mean no more of it than a small circle described upon the circle of the great world, of four English miles diameter, or thereabouts, of which the cottage where the good old woman lived is supposed to be its center. Stern, who, as Nietzsche fully recognized, was a pioneer in the exploration of the dynamics by which perspectives constitute a world, or worlds. Stern here, or rather Tristram, the difference is significant, but I can't go into it here, breaks the word world up into two different, if complementary, meanings. First, there is the small circle of about four English miles or thereabouts. At its center, the cottage where the good old woman lived. And second, there is the circle of the great world in which the midwife's small circle is both inscribed and described. <clears throat> where the center of this second great world is, Christian does not say, perhaps because it has no center, apart from the various personages to whom Tristram addresses his dedications, including one directed at the highest bidder, who, as the embodiment of wealth, has to remain anonymous. So he, he offers his novel to the, his dedication to the, whoever the patron will be who will give the most money for it. Uh, in short, there are two kinds of world in Stern's lexicon. The smaller ones, centered around singular beings and their lives, and the larger one, which has no center at all any longer, but which is ruled by money, power, and egos. A few pages after the introduction of the midwife, from which I've quoted, the lady's patron is described, namely one Parson York. It is due to his intervention that the midwife has been able to establish herself in the county. Parson York as his name suggests, is a distant descendant of Shakespeare's York, the king's jester, who appears in Hamlet only as a skull unearthed in the graveyard, and whose office, Tristram adds, has long been abolished 
quote, not only in that court, that of Denmark, but in every other court of the Christian world, end quote. But like his distant relative, Tristram's person York is also long since gone, and Tristram tells the sad story of his passing in order, quote, to show the temper of the world in the whole of this affair, end quote. And indeed, the world turns out to have a fearful temper, one which finally drives the good parson, who is described, among other things, quote, as heteroclite, a creature in all of his declensions, as you could find, which drives this heteroclite creature uh, prematurely to his grave. Without being able to go into here the details of this affair, su suffice it to say that what precipitates it is Yorick's undoing is nothing other than his plain speaking and his mordant wit. This is quote two on your handout. His jibes and his jests were never were not lost for want of gathering. As unpracticed in the world as a romping, unsuspicious girl of thirteen, the brisk gale of his spirits ran him foul ten times in a day of some bodies tackling. This description suggests you how much Europe already uh, was a trans creature. I want to let both in his, in his uh, name and in his sexuality and so on. In short, the world in which Yorick lives, which includes that of the midwife, gathers and stores information in its memory. And it is the way this memory then is put to use that reveals the distinctive financial logic of this world. Quote three illustrates that logic. The mortgager and the mortgagee differ from the one from the other, not more in length of purse than the jester and jeste do in that of memory. The one raises a sum and the other a laugh at your expense and think no more about it. Interest, however, still runs on in both cases. The periodical or accidental payments of it, just serving to keep the memory of the affair alive, till at length in some evil hour, pop comes the creditor upon each, and by demanding principal upon the spot, together with full interest to the very day, makes them both feel the full extent of their obligations. Long before the crisis brought up, the worldwide financial crisis brought about by subprime, subprime mortgages, Yorick falls victim to a world ruled not just by credit, but by interested credit, by interest and principal. But the stories of the mid midwife and of the parson tell us something significant about the subprime, uh, of the subprime world, especially in relation to that of the globe, the interested globe. The notion of world, to use an extremely felicitous phrase co coined by Jean-Luc Nancy, is singularly plural. You know his book, Être singulier pluriel, to be singularly plural. The same world of the midwife who brings life into the world and that of Parson Yorick, whose name and fate underscore the cruel jest of life quite mortal, as well as the no less cruel temper of the world that seeks to turn this to its profit, this same world is not at all the same, depending on the point of view from which it is traced and experienced. It is the same and it is different at once. It is always singular, but as such always more and less than one. One world and a world at one and the same time. Unlike the world which, as Derrida might have said in an untranslatable French phrase he coined, is always plus qu'un, more than one and therefore one no more. Unlike the, wor the world, this world, the globe claims to describe something more like a geometrical sphere, 
that is self-contained, but also all-embracing through boundaries that are taken as given. It is hard to treat a world or worlds as a perceptual object, although now we're getting there. It's not truly necessarily the Earth in the era of space travel. Worlds are difficult to imagine, much less to touch or control. By contrast, the globe has often encourages precisely such phantasms. One of the most powerful and humorous stagings of this phantasm can be found in a scene from Chaplin's well-known film, The Great Dictator, in which the mustache figure of Hitler is shown playing with the globe of the world, dancing with it, caressing with it, throwing it, kicking it ever higher. A few minutes. Say, uh, referring to a film of which I was just reminded by one of the papers we were discussing this afternoon, that this, this suggests what's under the skin of the, of the world, the explosion there. Um, here the globe becomes a toy in the hands of the, the infantile dictator who seeks to control, play with it, abuse it, and then collapses when it bursts and leaves it with nothing but its skin, as it were. In other words, the figure of the globe has become an object that present, represents not a world, but the world, the world as an object of interest that can be profitably manipulated, appropriated, and controlled by a solitary subject who stands outside it, continuing the phantasm of a creator god existing prior to and separate from the world and from the relational networks it involves as well. The ostensibly self-containment of the globe as sphere seems thus designed in this context to replace and absorb worlds that are like Yorick's 
heteroclines in all their declensions, that is, relational, but never simply universal or self-contained. The process of globalization can also be seen as one in which this singular plurality of worlds tends to be absorbed gradually into the phantasm of a single universal profitable world, finding an expropriate expression, perhaps, and extension in the German word for cosmic space, namely the word Weltall, literally world hall. The struggle through which the globe strives to reduce and deface the memory of other worlds is again documented unforgettably in the well-known passage in which Hamlet seeks to respond to the admonition of the ghost to remember me. This is quote five on your handout. Remember thee, he says, I thou poor ghost, whilst memory holds a seat in this distracted globe. Remember thee? Yea, from the table of my memory, I'll wipe away all trivial fond records, all sores of books, all forms, all pressures past, that youth and observation copied there. And thy commandment all alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain, unmixed with baser matter. Of course, just who the me is, who here appeals to Hamlet's memory depends, during the time of Shakespeare at least, on whether one assumes a Protestant or Catholic perspective in judging the nature of ghosts. For Catholics, ghosts were the dead on the way toward purging their sins and thus redeemable beings. For Protestants, and of course Hamlet studied in Wittenberg, ghosts were damned for all eternity, and a lot of the indecision of Hamlet has to be, I think, understood in this historical theological context. Hamlet's Protestant doubts, then, as to the redeemability of the authenticity of the ghost and of his story cannot simply be wiped away by his response, in which he invokes memory to help him control what he calls a distracted globe. But for this to work, for such control to work, the globe will have to be purged of all of its history, wiping away all trivial farmed records, all sores of books, all forms, all pressures past. The globe that is his head and mind can only thus perhaps become a place of an ahistorical and abstract single and simple mindedness of perfect and univocal focus thus paving the way to the complete obedience of the commandment that he hears and echoes in the ghost's words. In short, the globe will have to be filled with a single unequivocal message and meaning, guiding a no less unequivocal course of action. But of course, even without Yorick being present to remind him, this globe of Hamlet's has already played a joke on the prince, since it names the theater in which Hamlet the play was performed. This provides a critical counterpoint to the apparent resolution of the prince and to his decision to act accordingly. The project of eliminating the ambiguities of singular worlds and replacing them with the univocal order of a new globe is delimited by the fact that the globe is also, and perhaps above all, a theater, just as the world is a stage. In short, a place in which things do not have to wait to be moved, transported, and become something else because they are themselves already other than they seem to be. Translation materialized, corporealized, in and on the stage. The more the accent will be placed on ensuring global university against worldly equivocation, the more the plurality of worlds will become a scene of conflict, combat, and destruction. H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds is already pre-programmed in, uh, in the prehistory of their globalization. All of this to suggest that the notion of global translation is perhaps not an innocent one, even if the notion of globality today remains itself far from univocal in its significance. 
but to the extent that it suggests or is used to imply a space that is self-enclosed and self-contained, to the extent that it suggests the unity and oneness of the world, rather than its multiplicity and diversity, the kinds of translational practices that will sanction uh, it, that it will sanction, risk often perpetuating the self-destructive tendencies that have a very long, if fortunately not universal, history, and which, if I'm not mistaken, can be retraced at least as far back as the biblical myth of the creation of the world through a single, universal, and exclusive creator God, a supreme being felt to transcend the world that he creates. I call this the monotheological identity paradigm, and it seems to me to be very much with us today despite a secular tradition associated with modernity, but one which continues to be informed by this identity paradigm. I may seem to have strayed quite far from my original concern, which was to discuss what I've called the political economy of global translation. But what I've just mentioned provides a possible perspective from which to define certain tendencies that this phrase seeks to designate. In the idea of global translation of translations, I see two such tendencies moving in different directions. To describe them, I can find no better word than the German prefix, hardly a word, that forms the first part of the word for translation in that language. In German, a translation is generally called an Übersetzung, literally, a setting across or over. The reason why I find the German prefix here especially apt is because precisely of its double meaning. Namely, in German, Über suggests also, and perhaps most familiarly, a vertical access if not a hierarchy, and above, as distinct from and across, implying a below. This is why Nietzsche's notion of an Übermensch could have been, uh, has been translated as Superman, and also why Freud's notion of Übermensch has been translated as Superego. But as I've said, all Über, in German, also uh, signifies a cross, as in a crossing over. And taken seriously, this could yield a very different translation of Nietzsche's Übermensch, namely something like transhuman. Um, in German, as in English, the word over can, must not, but can, also suggest a horizontal movement that is not necessarily hierarchical, as in over there, for instance. This is how the German word functions in Übersetzung, translation a movement of setting across. In Greek, of course, this is almost equivalent to the word for metaphor, metaphorin, except that in German there is a difference between <coughs> übersetzen and another word that's very, very close to it, but different, übertragen. Setting across versus bearing or carrying across. Again, without being able to delve into this question here in detail, and it's very interesting, it should be noted that bearing or carrying across implies that the process of changing place, of transition or transposition, may well be associated with a certain corporeality, and, the, and with it, therefore, the enigmatic law of gravity that affects, that affects the movements of bodies in space and time. <coughs> Perhaps this is why an Übertragung in German is generally considered to be more transformative than an Übersetzung. More metaphorical, one could say, but only if one keeps in mind that all similarity includes and depends on dissimilarity. Just a little parenthesis. Uh, I worked in German theater for many, several years as a dramaturg, and the director with whom I worked the most, a man named Axel Mantai, who started out as a, as a stage designer, and became a director. Uh, in his ordinary uh, language, would use a word to sum up his method. And he, he said that in, in theater, everything must be stark übersetzt, which is very, very hard to translate into English. But he was using the strongly transposed, or strongly translated, 
you couldn't you can't really say that in ordinary English. You can say it in, in German, however, which shows again the way uh, uh, the implications there. The importance in recent years of the notion of trans in undermining fixed and binary gender oppositions, for instance, is part of the challenge posed to what I'm calling the monotheological identity paradigm, which is the basis for a notion of identity as that which must stay essentially the same despite spatial and temporal changes. As my examples from German might indicate, languages even and especially in an age of globalization remain irreducibly different and incommensurable, which does not mean, however, incommunicable. But such communicability implies that communication, like translation, should no longer be construed primarily as the transmission of fixed meanings across a neutral space from one language to another. The political economy of such extended and extended notion of translation, which insists on its differential transformative mo moment, will have to distinguish itself from the ever more dominant politics of neoliberal capitalism, which is always seeking to outdo itself, to trump itself, one could say, in terms of producing ever greater short-term returns upon investments for the benefit of an ever diminishing number of so-called stakeholders. The translational correlative of this practice is one that emphasizes the continuum of meaning across diverse languages while ignoring the processes, linguistic, but also socioeconomic and political, by which such meanings are produced and transformed. This is, this is I think, what moved Walter Benjamin in his well-known essay on the task of the translator to observe that, this is the last quote on your sheet, to observe that a real translation is transparent. It does not cover the original, does not block its light, this may be achieved by a literal rendering of the syntax, which proves words rather than sentences to be the primary element of the translator. For if the sentence is the wall before the language of the original, literalness is the arcade or the path. <coughs> the translation of Benjamin here, however, is imperfect in many ways, but necessar necessarily so. The principle that Benjamin recommends for translators is, although not often cited, one that is eminently practical, despite the theological language in which it is partially formulated, and which I have, by the way, eliminated from my quote his reference to pure language. Benjamin uses a word that is difficult, if not impossible, to render exactly in idiomatic language, English. The word is Wörtlichkeit. It literally would be wordliness, not wordliness, but wordliness. An adjectival noun translated in the passage quoted as literal. But it is not so much the letters, however, as the individual words that Benjamin is pointing to here, although paradoxically one has to take his sentence seriously in order to realize this. For it's only Benjamin's sentence that establishes a decisive opposition between the word and the sentence, which is uh, crucial in determining the significance of syntax. Literally, Benjamin advocates wordliness in the transmission of syntax. Note here that Benjamin uses the word you just distinguished from translation, in order to articulate the primary task of the translator. <coughs> what can it mean to carry not words with their ostensible meanings from one language to another, but their syntax, that is, their spatial and temporal arrangements. Let me venture a response with which I will conclude. Hopefully, as Tristram Shandy writes curiously, I want to suggest that Benjamin's insistence on a word-for-word -word syntax as the ideal of translation foregrounds the spatial, temporal, indeed almost corporeal experience of reading and writing, beginning but not ending with the traversal of the lines of the text, which is, which is to say, beginning with a certain kind of diachronic experience. If a verbatim transmission of the syntax of the text being translated is for Benjamin an ideal goal, it is because it alone preserves the physical movement of reading 
including that of the translator, in its radical singularity, a singularity that no generality of meaning can fully efface or absorb. It is this inexpungible singular perspective, which is more than a perspective, one that moves across and with the text while also resisting any simple appropriation of that text qua meaning that moves us toward another place into other <coughs> worlds, perhaps, whose significance will never be entirely englobed in global translations. Thank you for your patience.